Are we cool yet? We've looked at a number of anomalies so far through the scope of both science and religion. Anomalies with origins beyond our planet or reality. Anomalies created through foolish accidents or from ancient rituals. What we haven't really looked at, though, are anomalies created through the scope of art. Art is a subjective concept, one heavily divorced from the cold, clinical nature of the SCP Foundation, and so that's why we'll be discussing a group of interest focused on anomalous art. Are we cool yet? Like many groups in the SCP universe, AWCY exists as yet another fringe group that meddles with paranormal forces for their own goals. It just so happens that their goals consist of little more than creating really weird art pieces, many of which end up in Foundation custody. As usual, I'll be primarily looking at a handful of these contained exhibits to give us a better idea about the group, but let's see how they operate. Unlike many groups, Are We Cool Yet have no centralized leadership, no headquarters, no strict rules or traditions, and no official lists of members. Really, all it takes to be a part of Are We Cool Yet is to say that you are part of it, and to make anomalous art. Anomalous art is exactly what the name implies, and we'll get to some examples in a bit, but not all anomalous artists are part of AWCY. AWCY members tend to make art that is both highly visible to the public and often highly dangerous, leading some to decry the group as art terrorists. A potential origin for the group is outlined in the tale, Birth of the Cool. During the 19th century, the realm of science began to slowly understand the paranormal, and certain artists of the world took notice, beginning to create their own paranormal art pieces. By 1870, Paris was the center of anomalous art, and the debate about whether it should even exist. In 1874, the Salon des Magnifiques refused to allow any works of a phantasmagorical nature to be displayed at their grand exhibition. So a group of anomalous artists went off and started their own exhibition, held at the same time. The show was called Somnu Devenu Magnifique, which translates to Have We Become Magnificent. It was the talk of the town for months, and it was clear that this type of art wasn't going anywhere. This paranatural exhibition would be held every 10 years in different hidden locations, and the world of anomalous art would continue to grow. There would be a schism in this world, though, that came to a head at the 1924 exhibition between two anomalous artists. One was a French surrealist, and the other a Mexican artist who embraced the more accessible and realistic side of an art. The two debated for days before the opening of the exhibition about the relation of the artist to their work, the importance of context, of faith, knowledge, law, free will, God, the state, and so on. It seems that as the exhibition opened, they had come to understanding one another, and a photo was taken of them standing in front of the doors, with one leaning in to whisper into the other's ear. For decades, people speculated what might have been said there, or whether it was a challenge, or an affirmation of their understanding one another, or a reminder of why they were there, or an expression of amazement at how many had come to see their exhibition. According to one reporter who claims that he was close enough to hear, it was all of those, summed up in four words. Are we cool yet? Whether that's the actual origin of the movement or just a fun anecdote is up in the air, and really doesn't matter that much. The point is that for decades, members or claimed members of AWCY have been creating art pieces with the goal of shocking, amazing, and changing the world at large. Whether or not they're all art terrorists is up for debate, but I'd say the Foundation is perfectly fine with that definition, and have been cleaning up their messes for years. Let's look at some of those messes then, at least the ones that could be cleaned up. I've already talked about one of the most popular AWCY creations, SCP-1057, Absence of Shark, in my Aquatic SCPs video, so we'll skip over that one. SCP-1802 is a small robot, about 30 centimeters tall, composed of chicken bones, iron, leather, wire, heavy twine, and a tin can for a head. It is covered in a piece of white canvas resembling a lab coat, and has safety goggles secured on its head using screws. 
The robot is sapient and capable of speech, but is wholly devoted to the single task of collecting any miscellaneous objects it can find and storing them in out of sight places, such as behind a dumpster or at the foot of a tree. The objects it collects are generally worthless, including a bottle cap, acorns, insects, coat buttons, wrappers, or even small creatures such as a gecko. It's noted that the gecko escaped shortly after the robot collected it, though. It even managed to remove a road sign using stolen tools, but was not large enough to move it, so it merely buried it in place with leaves. 1802 was discovered by the Foundation when it attempted to remove a security camera on the exterior of a Foundation facility. In an interview with the robot, it claims that its earliest memory is waking up and seeing a group of people moving around making signs or pouring things. A man in charge of the robot told it that its purpose is to keep anything it finds and to study them so that it can learn. By doing this task, it will become cool. It collects everything it finds because it was told that it doesn't understand much. It was then placed outside and told to keep moving west, collecting things, until it came to a gate with a camera on it. It then tells the Foundation details about the building it came out of, leading the Foundation to raid the place. The last detail it provides is the name it was given, Skip. At the building, the Foundation only found a cardboard box with a note attached, reading, Found this for you, appreciate the gestures, and special procedures, figure it out. Inside the box was a white bottle cap, which the Foundation collected and labeled as an SCP. Basically, this whole thing was just an Are We Cool Yet member making fun of the SCP Foundation and what they do. Skip the robot named after the phonetic pronunciation of an SCP, collects things in the world that it doesn't understand, and stores them away from prying eyes. Sometimes things escape, such as lizards, and other times the Foundation contains things on the spot because they can't move them for whatever reason, like the road sign. As a final joke, they left the white bottle cap, implying that it's an anomaly, and the Foundation scooped it up and stored it away just like Skip would. In uncommon fashion, then, no one ended up getting hurt from this AWCY piece. On the other hand, we have something like SCP-1590, an application designed for touchscreen devices called the Book of Tamlin. Upon booting up, the application displays a welcome message saying, To Joey, who taught me how to be cool, and the name of the last person who played the game who almost made it out. The Book of Tamlin is a game consisting of a series of images of different rooms, and the player is given subsequent tasks to complete in each room, all of which consist of locating different objects in the room. Basically, it's a really messed up version of those cool I Spy books. The game consists of anywhere between 7 and 43 rooms, and the player also has a time limit between 1 and 12 minutes. The images and tasks are all personally relative to the player, beginning somewhat benign before becoming increasingly personal and traumatic. There isn't really any winning of the game though, as at either a random point during the game, or when the timer runs out, the screen displays the text, you found out everything there is to find about the house, now all you have left to find is the way out. The game then ends, and can't be replayed by the same person. Within 72 hours of this point, a door the player opens in real life will open instead to a room from the game they played, and eventually every door the player opens will open into the game, practically forcing them in. After they go through, all contact will be lost with the individual. As some examples of the games played by individuals, one D-class player saw a farm owned by his uncle, where his parents sent all of his pets, with the task of finding the graves of all seven of his childhood pets. Another image for the same D-class was a locker room from his middle school, where he was involved in multiple altercations with the task of finding the 13 boys who made his childhood a living hell. After finishing the game, the D-class opened a door that revealed the same locker room, 
at which point he charged through. An agent for the Foundation played the game, seen an image of his time on deployment in Korea. The task is to find the buddies he left behind. The door he opened in real life opened to the same scene, and he willingly entered with survival gear. Not all participants have entered willingly, as one female D-Class was sedated and forced through to confront her childhood trauma. In the end, once you play through, unless you can avoid opening doors for the rest of your life, you're going to have to go through. From most points of view, it seems more like cruel torture than a piece of art, but I guess maybe I'm not cool. Art is often created to change how people think about things, and that leads us to SCP-1127, which takes that concept pretty literally. 1127 are a series of anomalous short films, primarily composed of scenes taken from other films and videos. A narrator has also been added to each film, providing commentary and occasionally interacting with objects and characters from the original footage. Anomalous effects occur after an individual watches one of these films for at least 20 minutes, resulting in a permanent change to their normal behavior. One film, titled Were Clowns Always Yellow, takes footage from The Sound of Music, The Night Porter, The Day the Clown Cried, Surf Nazis Must Die, and archival footage from World War II. The narrator, a man wearing a Nazi uniform with his face obscured by clown makeup, comments that when our lives become the joke, humor becomes a war crime. The punchline is always death, and to get it is to abandon the pretense that getting it matters. Laugh at the reality that is laughing at you. At this point, the narrator produces a pistol and shoots actor Jerry Lewis in the back of the head. After watching the film, viewers will consider it to be the funniest thing they've ever seen, but will express disturbance and disgust at any normally humorous communication. Most jokes will be seen as offensive, but material that is normally offensive or distressing will be seen as amusing. Another film, titled Crazy Where You Are, combines footage from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Faces of Death, various animated short films featuring Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry, and a Three Stooges short. The narrator is a female child, around 12 years old, wearing a blue dress and a black domino mask. Throughout the film, she slowly dismembers a teddy bear with a small knife, and asks questions such as, are you afraid of violence, and whether violence is the answer or the question. After watching the film, viewers will generally express no strong emotional response to it, and will also lose interest and emotional connections to things, activities, and people. They will also fail to react to dangerous and hostile environments, and will start to injure others merely out of curiosity. Another film is especially dangerous, as viewing it is liable to make viewers compulsively perform illegal and perverse activities. Since these films are popping up randomly around the internet, in video stores, and in theaters, you can see how AWCY gets pretty easily labeled as terrorists. Speaking of compelling people to do things just for the sake of being cool, there's another app, SCP-1883. This one's pretty simple, as the app just displays a user's score, and every 5-9 to nine hours updates with a new task that they can perform to earn points. It's not really clear how the app can tell when a user has completed a task, but there is a mild compulsive effect that encourages players to continue performing tasks. This effect increases when numerous players gather together to compete, and they begin to follow informal hierarchies based on each other's scores. If a task involves communication with another person, the app will somehow spread to that person's phone, making the app fairly dangerous as of course the tasks become pretty worrisome. Looking at a sample list of tasks provided, it starts out fairly basic, awarding one point for saluting the sun, and seven points for finding a horse and watching it for 30 minutes, three points for banging your head against a wall, 
and 10 points for telling a stranger what you really think about them. If you manage to turn gold into lead, you get 999 points, which is pretty cool. The instructions sometimes include text that isn't a task, such as, if Babe Ruth was that great, why did he need a bat? To earn 150 points, you must rob a bank, but only take quarters. For only half a point, you can convince another person that you are dead, and if you kick a yellow dog, you get no points, which you would think no one would do, but you'd be surprised, I'm sure. 200 points to eat something that has been in a grave, and 90 points to walk on glass and describe the noise it makes. Sometimes you might have to ignore a task to get 21 points, which is probably trickier than it seems, and if you gain 5 points, you get 5 points. If you burn an irreplaceable object and manage to replace it, that's worth 100 points. But it's only 15 points if you love someone. Sometimes breathing might actually cost you 200 points. And a couple tasks are apparently so horrific that the foundation expunged them, worth 300 and 450 points. The text after those two says, the real skeleton was inside you all along. Are we cool yet? The Foundation heard about the app after an incident in which at least 72 people irreparably wounded their left eyes with household objects, most of which were using the app, meaning that some did it just for the fun of it. Stendhal Syndrome is a supposed psychosomatic condition that involves people suffering from heart palpitations fainting, and even hallucinations after viewing art of incredible beauty. Members of AWCY would of course be interested in this phenomenon, bringing us to SCP-1074, an oil painting on canvas that, when photographed, just looks completely gray. When viewed directly though, viewers suffer from symptoms similar to Stendhal Syndrome, and will attempt to vividly describe the painting they are seeing to any nearby. No two viewers have described it as the same artwork, but they all agree that it is the most beautiful and moving piece of art they have ever seen. They will not turn their heads from it unless forced, and will attempt to convince everyone else nearby to view it as well. They will also begin to discuss philosophical questions related to the painting, bringing up human mortality, individual insignificance, legal or moral judgment, and religious eschatology. Within three to five minutes of exposure, the individual will become permanently catatonic, but will continue to display brain activity as if they were fully awake and aware. If forcibly removed before this point, they will stave off catatonia for some time, continuing to describe every detail of the painting, and report even seeing it in their dreams. Typically within five to eight days, though, they will slip into the same coma unless treated with amnestics to wipe their memories. Even then though, the foundation has yet to find a way to permanently prevent it, and the longest someone has gone is six weeks before going catatonic. In an interview with the D-Class who was exposed to the painting, he describes it with confusion, as it seems to be a painting of himself on his knees, crying. There are flames all around him, and he surmises that he's in hell, along with Jesus Christ. Jesus is scowling at the D-Class, and he is holding a flaming sword, as well as a scale with a heart on one side and an apple on the other. The apple is depicted as heavier, and the man interprets this to mean that Jesus is judging him, and he is guilty. Although he had vehemently denied in court the crime of murdering his wife and child, he now admits to it, and says that, of course, Jesus knows, and it all makes sense now. He says that he is nothing and everything. Everything is nothing, and that everything is imaginary. We have to exist, though, and we must will ourselves into existence in order to vanquish the dreamer that dreams of our existence. After going silent for some time, the D-Class says that he has one question. Are we cool yet? 
That's a question we'll likely never have a definitive answer to. AWCY is a disjointed, confusing mess of an organization, just the way they prefer it. There's no real goals or end game for me to discuss here. It's all simply art, and art can't always be readily explained. There is a lengthy series of tales regarding AWCY called The Cool War, which I didn't touch upon at all in this video, so we'll have to save that for another time, as it provides a more specific look at members of the group. AWCY aren't the most popular group of interest, as they often come across as pretentious and insufferable, and they are a far cry from the unknowable Lovecraftian roots of the SCP universe. Love them or hate them, though, you can't deny the efforts they go through just to be cool.